Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Someone's Got to Do Something, Negotiating Institutional Responses to Chat GPT by Engaging Generative AI. Um, you're already all muted. Please put your questions in the chat and prep put in front of the question Q colon so that we can pull them out from any comments. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed presenters, Samuel Collins and Trish Westerman from Towson University. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being with us. This is Trish Westerman, Assistant Provost for Faculty Academic Center of Excellence at Towson, which uh, the acronym is FACET, so we'll use that today. And my co-presenter, so the lead presenter is Sam Collins. Sam? Hi, uh, my name is Sam Collins, and I'm a professor of, of anthropology and the sociology anthropology and criminal justice department, and I'm also a research fellow at our faculty center, FACET. Back to you, Trish. Thanks, Sam. So um, the title of our of our talk really, uh, I think, it captures where we all were in November 2022. Uh, somebody's got to do something. All this craziness is coming at us. What do we do? There, there are all these capabilities. The students are all going to cheat. You know, how are we going to handle it? Should we just shut everything down? You know, all these uh, real fears and anxieties came through the provost's office to me and um, as, the, as the director and assistant provost for the center. So um, immediately I started working with the faculty fellows. We have a whole team of them uh, to try to figure out what we should do. You know, we knew we didn't want to shut things down or completely open up and embrace everything immediately. We wanted to take that line that the keynote talked about, which is the slow walking. Let's really take some time, see what the evidence is. Make some, do some reflections, some real discussion, you know, engage in collaborative work and then make some decisions. And so that's what we've decided to do at FACET. Um, we were given the lead. Um, we asked for the lead and were granted it, which was wonderful uh, for a task force for the whole campus. And that began in August of 2023. So that's run for this entire calendar or for other academic year. And um, the focus of the task force was to determine all the positives and negatives and kind of neutral issues around generative AI in higher education. So regarding teaching and learning and faculty research primarily, but now that's branched out to other areas as well. So our membership is almost all faculty with about 30 members and about 25 of them are faculty, but we also have representation from some key offices on campus, including the Writing Center, the Advisement Center, and, um, and the Judicial Processes and Restorative Practices Center. That's the one that involves academic integrity for students. And so we've engaged in monthly meetings where we have had really good evidence-based discussion um, really great collaboration, every voice is welcome, and where we've gathered uh, some really good ideas that we're gonna build into a report for our provost um, that we'll send out to her at the end of May. And this really is going to consist of about 10 different topic areas, most of them you're very familiar with, you know, all the usual suspects really. Um, and then some statements that we've come up with, some guidance, that the task force has come up with um, based on the collaborative discussion about evidence-based practice. And so all those areas that, you know, that are listed here on our outline are the things that you've all talked about. Um, and so they're very familiar, I think, to everyone. When we um, started this process with the task force, the idea was to make the process very participatory and flexible. And, and we've been really, um, we think, successful in doing that. So some of our initial outcomes from the task force are um, to focus discussion on, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down on AI usage in general. And, and of course, we're gonna adopt that middle position of really being reflective, gathering evidence, and then making decisions in a collaborative manner. Secondly, um, and the focus on um, tool adoption. So generative AI tool adoption was a real question that came pretty early on in the conversation. You know, can we get this for our department? Can we get this for our students? And so we um, worked with the provost office and with um, to, to identify a standing committee of the Senate um, that now has taken on that charge. That's an interim um, outcome that was already implemented from the task force. The rest of these are, are kind of preliminary outcomes that will go into our report. 
Third, um, just looking at evidence-based practice for teaching and learning, research, et cetera, and really not only gathering that information, but also disseminating it in a number of different ways. So we're, we'll have a web page that we're starting, we're actually two th thirds of the way through constructing um, that will be on the Towson University website. So it will be public facing. And then we also disseminate through um, through network protected area, areas, um, some really great um, resources for the faculty particularly. And then we want to disseminate, continue to disseminate through workshops. So we've had our second semester of um, AI workshops, self-paced self workshops that we've been running, and we'll be continuing to, to do those, as well as we have monthly drop-ins for several hours where we help um, faculty and others with questions that they're grappling with around AI. So of all those topic areas that you see in front of you, the most really sticky and tricky area, but also one of the most important and interesting is um, the area of ethics. And so we've really focused a lot of attention on the issues of data privacy and security and bias and equity, uh, social justice, community impact. These are all really near and dear to the mission of our university. And so they're especially important to us. And I'm going to shift over to Sam now, and he's going to talk about that particular area. Great. Uh, thanks, Trish. Um, so um, I wanted to talk a little more in detail about the ethical reflection part, but also uh, to point out that I did put a question in the chat, uh, which now has been uh, already passed by by other questions, but uh, I asked what is being done institution-wide at your campuses? And uh, Trish and I and our, our faculty center in general, we're very interested to learn what is happening in Maryland at our, uh, you know, um, other institutions. So um, when we looked at the ethical issues in generative AI, really, I mean, these are the big questions that uh, we're asking in terms of you know, not only like that that sense of like teaching and ethics and so on, but ethics in the largest sense, how are we going to live in a world with generative AI? How are we going to, to, to teach in that world? Uh, how are we going to prepare students? How are we going to address uh, the new kinds of inequalities that come from a generative AI world? And uh, just the, um, those those fit into some fairly familiar categories. Um, and I say that because we've done this several times before when new technologies, new applications um, are introduced. We as educators, especially those of us who, um, you know, are, are not computer scientists and so on, we inevitably have to react to them, uh, to incorporate them, or to acknowledge that they are a problem uh, for our classes and our students. So uh, just to quickly kind of summarize a, a few of these, number one, um, the black boxing part. Generative AI uh, is not entirely black box. There are uh, some applications which are more transparent than others, but the most popular ones, and we've already been talking about that in other sessions um, and in our keynote, Gemini and all the open AI, AI products and Midjourney and all that stuff, they're all black box. Where do they get their training data from? Uh, what, what kinds of sources are, are being consulted? Uh, none of that is clear to us. Uh, we can't ask generative AI to, to you know, give us a, a list of sources it consulted when it came up with its summary. Uh, and so that kind of black boxing is an ethical problem. And it's an ethical problem uh, unless there's AI transparency and AI explainability. Uh, and uh, well, the second one almost ensures that we're not going to see widespread transparency or explainability because there are so many pending lawsuits um, that have to do with the way that um, different corporations, companies have basically hoovered up data to train their AI, uh, we've seen all kinds of content creators, journalists, musicians, um, of course, uh, the, the big actress strike, all, all of this had its roots in uh, an understanding that, that their work was going to be used without their permission or compensation. Um, the third part, the idea of um, a widening digital divide, I just want to point out that digital divides can take many shapes. We're, we're well beyond the initial thinking about digital divide that 
maybe some of us grew up with uh, in the 1980s, you know, a digital divide that's really who has the technology or who does not. In this case, we, we can say um, that uh, for the most part in the U.S., people have access to some of these tools, but that doesn't mean that there's no digital divide. The question here is like, what kind of tools um you know if you can only afford the free ones and you lack uh, the money to afford the subscription-based uh, journey of ai agents then are you behind people who have those uh if colleges Samuel? and university oh sorry go ahead sorry i just want to let you know it was five minutes oh thank you very much um colleges and universities um um, may be able to afford some, but not all of these different services. Uh, the other part of the digital divide has to do with training. How can we train our students um, if they aren't trained in prompt engineering, using AI, the problems with AI, the, the moments where AI probably cannot be used, uh, then they're widening that digital divide gulf as well. Um, so, um, the final one is the automation of labor. Many times, uh, especially you know, in, in the computer age, um, different computer processes are adopted by corporations primarily to save money on labor. And certainly uh, this has been one of the selling points, albeit one that's not really been realized in most industries uh, for generative AI in uh, the business and corporate world. They're, they're going to be able to replace workers or replace processes with generative AI. Um, some industries seem to be more susceptible to that than others. Uh, for example, some copywriting or marketing, uh, some kinds of, of telemarketing or helplines uh, seem to be particularly susceptible, uh, but we'll have to see what happens with that. The other part, to the labor uh, issue is the way that so much labor goes into developing generative AI models. Um, the uh, what's called shadow work, uh, micro work, all, all these different places around the world, typically in the global south, where people have been paid very little money to uh, go through the process of training AI agents to recognize image, put together sentences, and so on. Um, so, all these things make up some of the very broad, but also very specific uh, things that we're considering with AI on our campus. It's not just about this sort of larger societal critique. It's about situating the education that we provide students, the work that we do at the university uh, in the context of this larger debate, which we, of course, are also a part of. Um, so what we wanted to do for our discussion uh, we've got a couple of reflections down here. Um, the first one, what ethical issues are you grappling with on your campuses? Uh, and the second, going to the sort of question of digital divide, uh, given the very real possibility of fresh digital divides through differential access to AI tools, what do we need to consider now to help determine how to best train and educate our students? Uh, so we'll start to take uh, answers and discussions through the chat and uh, see what you all come up with. And thank you all for including um, what's going on on your campuses. That initial question that Sam asked, some people have said summer workshops, some webinars through their libraries, a brand new task force on AI. So it's good to see that things have been rolling and um, are getting rolling on the different campuses. And Sam and I want to just offer to continue the conversation with any of you that are interested. Um, so as we you know, move out of this session a little bit later, we'll um, give you our email address again, which is facet, F-A-C-E-T, at Towson.edu. But for now, if, if you have responses to the two questions in the chat, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I am, I am like, I'm like struck by the, the digital divide uh, as I collect into the semester assignments, and some of them, I'm like, I'm like, if only you knew the problems with with this approach uh, before you handed in that essay to me. But, um, oh, great, um, thank you, Nancy. Uh, she, she says that we'd be happy to help boost participation in an ongoing conversation around this. Yeah, we we would really welcome that. Um, Naomi writes that one interesting issue we've been warned about is AI bots that automatically join online meetings to generate transcripts. 
and how important it is to kick them out if we're discussing anything sensitive. Oh, interesting. Um, this is this is one of the things that that Zoom, for example, is trying to sell us our AI bots to generate summaries of meetings. That actually, that question came up about this this uh, uh, event. We were, you know, what if people use AI bots to record? And you know, everyone had, you know, the same response, which is like, it's fine. It's going to be public, but still. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, one of the other than than um, the question of privacy. Uh, one of the other things that that we're concerned about is the fate of those summaries and transcripts. Uh, even now, um, you know, the the amount of content that we generate that goes into training AI is tremendous. And oftentimes uh, the onus is on the user to opt out of that rather than the corporation. So Adobe, yeah, you have to go and opt out if you uh, happen to to create um, uh, documents that are online through Adobe's cloud, you got to opt out of that going into training. So good luck. <laughs> um, these are these are great questions about the privacy of the meeting. I'm noting in the chat that what we. Yes, definitely. But, and then also about the student use, there has been, it, you know, with student um, surveys that have been done on our campus and on others as well, the student perceptions of AI are, are very mixed um, and, and their usage is also very mixed. And so part of our, one of our outcomes is going to be student training that we're going to offer to the provost. If she approves, we'll offer that to all of our new first year and transfer undergraduate students so that there won't be so much confusion. The main confusion students are talking about is my, you know, this professor says, don't use it at all. This other professor says, use it in this way. This right. other professor says, use anything you want. And how am I supposed to keep it all straight? And, you know, now I'm being called up for an, an academic integrity violation. And it was just that, you know, my head is swimming with all these possibilities. So yeah. we really have to help the students to grapple with that as well. Right. You know, I mean, that, that's something that, that you that you didn't um, really have time to talk about, Trish. But, you know, we're, we're really trying to... Um, sort of walk that thin line between recommendations and policy. Um, you know, we, we, we really, because we are a faculty center, we really believe in academic freedom. Um, at the same time, it seems so clear that, that um, you know, some students being able to use Grammarly while others are punished for it seems extremely unfair and also confusing to uh, our, our academic integrity uh, committees and so on. Oh, it's interesting to see someone makes the um, analogy to group work. Remember during during the pandemic, that was a big issue that the students didn't know if it was okay to collaborate on things or not. And so mm. one of our first things that FACET did was to talk to the faculty about making their, their syllabi very, very clear, just that, that communication has to come through loud and clear. You may communicate in this way for this assignment. You may not communicate you know, for this other assignment. So um, really key to put the guidelines in for each assignment and really being specific about tools as well. You know, you mentioned Grammarly. It used to be just an editor and now it's actually creating content. So there has to be that clarity on the syllabus and with the faculty and with the students about that. Right. Um, um, Nancy asks if there's any consensus at the uh, departmental or program level with these tools, not at our university. Uh, we And we really want to help facilitate those conversations. We think that departments should all be having them. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, again, um, uh, to, to reiterate, I, I would like if, if faculty were able to decide for themselves, but come on, there's d disciplinary um, concerns and departments should address them. And specifically within departments, for example, English, I spoke to the English chair just a couple of weeks ago as part of the task force work, and she said they are talking about Grammarly and whether to prohibit it in their English 102 and creative writing courses. And they may make a decision on, you know, on a sub-departmental level. And we encourage that as long as there's real discussion and the people are willing, you know, the faculty are willing to adopt that, um, we're fine with that. But um, the more communication and discussion we can have, the better.
A lot of questions coming down the pike. I know there are a lot of them and we're at time. I hate to cut this off because this is really, really good, but um, and Nancy, you can confirm for me, we're going to try to capture all of this and, and put it all in one place so we can revisit some of these topics and, and, and questions um, because this is a good one. Uh, I wanna thank our presenters, uh, Trish and Samuel. The next session begins at 1210, the breakout rooms will remain open this time, we're pretty sure. <laughs> if you aren't sure which session to attend next, you can consult the program or go out to the main room and ask for help. Thank you again and enjoy your next session. Thank you again to the presenters.